and welcome to All the Year Round. We're a seasonal monthly podcast about British 19th century literature. I'm Emma Probeck. I'm writing a book about Jane Austen, Elizabeth Gaskell, and the novel of manners. And I'm Dr. Haley Finn, and I look at the portrayal of dreams, especially in periodicals. So, this month we are talking about Victorian motherhood in honour of Mother's Day. But first, in keeping with our now grand tradition, tomorrow is the fourth Sunday of Lent. So, if you are in the UK, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, Ireland, Jersey, or Nigeria, tomorrow is Mother's Day. So, if you need to, go grab some presents, cards, flowers anything you might need. Grab your coat, grab your keys, grab some ear pods, take us with you. Um, and let's crack on with the episode. So you'll notice something if you're watching us on YouTube, a little bit different this time around. We have a lovely, lovely set of tea. It's it's a lovely set that Hayley actually has. It's, it's Alice in Wonderland themed. Um, so Hayley, shall we have some tea? We should. Shall I be mother? Yes, please. Uh, so while Haley's doing that for us, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of tea. Uh, so the origins about the phrase, shall I be mother, are much debated. But the History of Tea Project at Queen Mary University of London has looked into the origins and has found that it is originally associated with the imaginative life of children in Victorian Britain. And it first appeared in Elizabeth Sill's poem, The Children Party, published in the nursery, a monthly magazine for youngest people in 1873. I love that. Youngest people. <laughs> Only the youngest. A fetus. <laughs> um, <laughs> the opening lines of the poem are, Will you come to our party today, Carrie Wynn? The party is all ready now to begin, and you should be mother and pour out the tea, because you're the oldest and best of the three. I am the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> There's three people in this household right now. <laughs> Haley's the oldest, so it, be appropriate. it all matches <laughs> up. Uh, so this child play practice was well known enough that it was noted in Alice Bertha Gomes' The Traditional Games of England, Scotland and Ireland in 1894, where she wrote, To be mother, a child will pretend to pour out tea or sew or do some other kind of household work, the doing of which is associated with being a mother. So the blog post goes on to talk about its uses in the 20th century and actually mentions one of my favourite novels of all time by Patrick Hamilton, a classic text called 20,000 Streets Under the Sky, published in 1935, a novel where everyone seems to be going for tea every few pages. It's, it's constant. Um, it gave me a very romanticised idea of what lion's tea was like. Um, and the fact that the phrase had fallen out of fashion by the time you get to John Fowles when he's in his abduction novel, um, The Collector, in 1963, it's a really creepy novel. Um, it's it's short, creepy. Um, just brace yourself should you ever read it. I'm intrigued. I think I have a copy. I'll lend it to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so... In this novel, the kidnapper, Frederick Clegg, he tries to impress his captive, Miriam, um, by offering her tea out of this fine china. Um, and he, he says, shall I be mother? And she kind of snaps back at him and says that the phrase is stale and dead and everything square that ever was. Um, so if you want to check out this blog post um, and their project, we'll be linking them in the description on YouTube and in the show notes on Spotify. So... Let's chat about the history of Mother's Day um, and Mothering Sunday. Do you want to do that so I can have some tea? <laughs> yes. Uh, we were looking at um, Beaton's English Women's Almanac and what they said about Mother's Day, um, which they have, um, they have a nice little explanation of Mother's Day to them. And they say that Midland Sunday is in many parts of England known as Mothering Sunday. Because in times gone by, this was a day on which people visited the Mother Church and presented an offering on the High Altar. Whilst the epistle on the occasion, being the one which we still use, contained a reference to Jerusalem. And in some counties, domestic servants still keep up the old custom of visiting their parents and take some present to their mother. The creed of the holiday makers is, 
On Mothering Sunday above all other, every child should dine with its mother. So centuries ago, people obviously returned to you know their home, their mother church, um, in this week of Lent. And you can kind of see the crossover between mother church and families begin to get intertwined to the extent that in the 19th century, you know, domestic servants were taking time off um, to go home and they probably had a nice trip to the church as well. I think that actually does still happen today because people do go visit their mothers to have lunch on Mother's Day and Mother's Day afternoon teas are often advertised and things like that. So yeah, it's still quite similar. I think so. And you can see this tradition in Mothering Sunday, which, um, if you didn't know, seems to have pretty much always involved cakes and flowers. Um, so the classic Mothering Sunday cake was known as the Simnel cake. And it's just for you, maybe. <laughs> I'm allergic to almond and this is the most yeah. almond cake. Not good. No, <laughs> no, it almond, isn't. But otherwise, lovely. I'll take a word for it. <laughs> To make an almond free version, <laughs> what would that what be like? <laughs> Find out. Oh my lord! Oh lord! <laughs> um, so, although similar cake is now widely associated as an Easter cake, it used to be made on Mothering Sunday, which was also is also known as Refreshment Sunday. So it's a it's a break in the fast uh, when fasting was relaxed. Um, and boy, would this have been a sweet treat! Beaton's English woman's Almanac describes it as uh, fermenting or fermenting, and they say it's the popular dish of the season, and it's composed of creed wheat, thickened milk, sugar, currants, raisins, and spice, and cakes termed simmels, uh, or fine, it's basically made of fine flour is what they're saying there, are also much eaten in the west of England. And interestingly, when we were looking this up, there was some mention of um, it being slightly different in different parts of the country, wasn't there? Yes, so there's there's a special one that Bury has, there's a special one that Shrewsbury has. There are, I'm just thinking, because there traditionally are differences in them. So maybe someone has come up with what is essentially an almond cake without almonds? So maybe maybe check if, we'll the searches. Searches. if we find That's one, we'll link it in the show notes. Yeah, for fellow people like me, allergic to nuts. Um, so it also became common practice in some churches as part of the tradition of um, Mothering Sunday to present bouquets of spring flowers like daffodils and violets uh, to mothers and basically women of childbearing age. So it seems like a nice Sunday altogether. And again, that's something that, that still happens. Yes. So visiting for lunch, giving mothers flowers, all, all still happening. Yes, and not to be cheap, but guys, if you, if you do want flowers, the daffodils are on at like one pound right now. So, you know, it's too, very get, traditional. Get going, get going, exactly. <laughs> but this leads us back onto the idea of what is it to be a mother? What is it to be mothering in Victorian Britain? Yeah, and that's not necessarily just um, mothers in the in the traditional sense. Mm. So when I think of um, Victorian mothers, because I look at dreams and um, dream guides, when you read the titles of dream guides, it's often called Mother Something's Dream Guide. So like Mother Shipton's Dream Guide, Mother Bunch's Dream Guide. Um, and there's uh, an article by Maureen Perkins um, where she suggests that that's because it makes it seem as though they're more more reliable because a lot of the time the dream guides were aimed at young women and if you feel like you've got that maternal figure, somebody who's got more life experience than you and they want to advise you, it sounds quite, it feels a bit more reassuring. Uh, they understand what you're going through and they want to, to advise you. Yeah, um, they have that in fairy tales as well, for, I, I guess, which are almost kind of, kind of like, dream guides but for children because you start the fantastical elements you have like mother goose's tales the things like that the kind of the mothering yeah. aspect of it yeah it's, it's I think traditional. Actually that might be slightly different because that's oh. more of like a uh, the storyteller as that that guiding voice whereas um in dream guides you get that less of a of a storyteller or more of a kind of have you dreamt of Apples? If so, this might happen to you. <laughs> so, a bit of um, 
Bit of diversion there, but I guess similarly, <laughs> I'm more prescriptive guidance, almost. Yeah. But um, yeah, less kind of didactic and more sensational. <laughs> yes, <honest>. yes. <sighs> I'm a, bit, I'm a bit scared to know what will happen if I eat an apple or if I dream of an apple now. Okay, like, one day we'll have to uh, get one of the Victorian dream guides out. <laughs> yes. We'll interpret your dream. Oh my, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, let's do that. I love that. So we saw in last month's episode, kind of similar with the dream guides of that, mm. that kind of... Um, aspect of the mother figure and we saw that with women authors and novels that were endorsed by women editors and public figures like Anna Letitia Barbold. Um, so in her introduction to the British novelists she wrote an essay called The Origin and Progress of Novel Writing where she wrote that novels gave young people some knowledge of the world which is attained with more ease and attended with less danger than by mixing in real life. Mm -hmm. And so she goes on to say, if the stage mirrors life, so is the novel, and perhaps a more accurate one, as less is sacrificed to effect and representation. There are many descriptions of characters in the busy world, which a young woman in the retired scenes of life hardly meets with at all, and many whom it is safer to read than to meet. And to either sex, it must be desirable that the first impressions of fraud, selfishness, profligacy, and perfidity should be connected, as in all good novels, they always will be, with infamy and ruin. Dramatic. <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> At any rate, it is safer to meet with a bad character in the pages of a fictitious story than in the polluted walks of life. But an author solicitous for the morals of his reader will always be sparing in the introduction of such characters. Mm. Actually, very similar to um, that article that I was just talking about with Maureen mm. Perkins. She kind of was saying the, uh, a similar thing, at least. Um, obviously, much later. But, yeah, that idea of, especially in periodicals for Perkins, that the stories that you're reading have, um, they can they can teach you something that's important about about real life, about society, without actually having to uh, experience the, the dangers of it. Yes, yes. I remember we spoke about... Um, Lydia potentially have been, might have benefited from yeah. reading a periodical or two um, with some instructions about avoiding military men, mostly. <laughs> I think yes, this is not, not doing any of that. <laughs> not doing any of that. It's like in a very meta sense, reading materials in the 19th century took on that role of the mother yeah. themselves. Um, sometimes by taking the actual mother in the story out of it and and Hayley came across and I actually came across this when we were looking for our favorite mothers in Victorian literature and we began to realize how many of them are dead or absent or just wildly ineffectual yeah it, it was surprising actually because we <laughs> we initially came up with the idea of um we'll put in our favorite Victorian mothers and then just sort of we're on the phone for a while saying what are our favourite Victorian mothers who are the Victorian mothers that we actually know or mothers in Victorian fiction I should say or yeah. a fictional <laughs> yeah <laughs> we extended this to aunts we extended mm -hmm. it to elder sisters we extended it to just maternal figures in literature itself but you you kind of understand why they're not there because if they're not there then it's the writer or the author of that work who has to take on that responsibility of basically as Barbold was saying taking you through a cautionary tale where mm -hmm. a young woman does not have a strong if you have a strong maternal influence you probably don't have a novel <laughs> yeah you don't have a, you don't have as much need presumably for the guidance because guidance is supposed to come from the mother and actually I think we're coming back to that later. Yes, but we are. First of all, shall we explain who our favourite Victorian mothers are yes. after much deliberation? Yes. Okay, so my first one is a bit of a a bit of a weird one, <laughs> but uh, as I was thinking about mothers and mothering figures, the one that kind of stood out in my mind from my past research was um, 
a, a fantasy example from Fantasties by George MacDonald. And um, in Fantasties, the main character, um, Anadas, he travels to Fairyland. And it's, uh, it's a kind of um, coming-of-age tale. He enters Fairyland on his 21st birthday and he has to travel through there kind of experiencing and learning different things along the way. Um, at one point, he reaches the uh, palace of Fairyland, and within the palace, there is a library. And if you read the books in this library, it's not just like normal reading. You actually sort of become transported into it. It's a very kind of intense experience where Anna just feels as though he is participating in the book and one of those books um, he explains is about a world that's not quite like ours and the reason that it's not quite like ours is because all of the women in this land have wings instead of arms and it's very <laughs> it's very based upon um, mothering because the uh, one of the other reasons that it's not a world quite like ours is because women don't give birth in this world. They just find babies out in, in nature. Convenient. So, yeah, very. And um, so they just go out picking babies like you would pick flowers is the comparison that he makes in the book. If you want a baby, you, just, um, you, you choose the, the time of day that you want, the season that you want, and um, you go out and see if you can find one. <laughs> Collect one, if you yes. will. Uh, so he says, um, after they grow up, the men and women are but little together. There is this peculiar difference between them, which likewise distinguishes the women from those of the earth. The men alone have arms. The women only have wings. Resplendent wings, are they? So you don't just get kind of like plane wings or, or bird's wings. Um, their wings are actually... Um, they're coloured depending on the season that they were found. So if you if you find a female baby, <laughs> they will um, they will eventually have colourful wings, and the colour of their wings will depend upon the season, at the time of day, um, the environment in which they were found. Hey, I don't think you thought this through. Like, no, sorry, just to interrupt your <laughs> flow, but like, how do opposable thumbs work? Opposable wings. Like, you know, no, I mean, the, no, the thing, no. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting about this is the, the wings. And there is an illustration of this, which, um, oh, I'm sure let, we can... let me have a little look. I want to have a little look. <laughs> right. It's horrifying. Um, and so if you, if you would also like to see this image, um, you will be posting it on our Twitter and our Instagrams, which are also linked in the description mm. and in the Spotify show notes. No, actually I, um, I think that the wings in the image don't don't thoroughly match the way I imagine the wings as George okay. McDonald describes them because in the image they're very a kind of um, angelic looking wings. Okay. So they uh, it's a woodcut image, so they're black mm -hmm. and white, but um, they do look quite angel like. Whereas the the wings that he actually describes, mm -hmm. or they sound more insect like or fairy like. Oh, um, like, kind of like a butterfly. Oh, like butter. Oh, uh, okay. That that's cuter. Yeah. Instead of, so like, <laughs> I was getting like Doctor Who, angel, terrifying statue flashbacks. Yeah, although the practicality of this is obviously quite questionable. The only thing they can realistically do is kind of hold and rock the baby, which is what you see in the image. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's, um, it's quite suggestive of the fact that that is the main sort of purpose of them. Um, of the women as mothers but i do love the wings the wing descriptions are um they believe you make up for the impracticality so like for example if you were born in the winter um so your wing would be <laughs> winter baby here uh would be great white wings white as snow the edge of every feather shining like the sheen of silver so that they flash and glitter like frost in the sun but underneath, they're tinged with faint pink or rose colour. I would look great. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. And that no, one that, actually, 
that's probably the most angelic kind of sounding of the wings, that white feather. Um, but then you have oh. things like... Oh, Hayley, the illustrator has done this description dirty. <laughs> They've done George dirty, Hayley. They have just not listened. They've not taken instruction. Yeah, I mean, if, you, um, if you're born in autumn, you would have purple wings with a rich brown on the inside. Ooh which sounds very nice. But because those colours are modified and altered in all varieties, which correspond to the mood of the day and the hour, as well as the season of the year, sometimes the colours are so intermingled that uh, Anadas could not determine the season, um, though doubtless, he says, the hieroglyphic could be deciphered by more experienced eyes. And our most complicated example that we get is Wings of deep carmine with an inner down of warm grey around a form of brilliant whiteness. Because she had been found as the sun went down through a low sea fog, casting crimson along a broad sea path into a little cave on the shore where a bathing maiden saw her lying. So wow. this is a very, very complex kind of um Yes, I mean, situation it's, with the wings. But it's somewhere a split between like trying to decipher various colours, but also like as a nineties baby, like kind of like mood ring wings. Yeah, is what we're working yes. with here, and it is. It's very um, tied to nature as well. So yeah. the nature of the baby will be uh, determined by by all of those factors that also show in its wings. But yeah, I think um, it doesn't. It doesn't quite do it justice with the just purely angelic looking wings because they are obviously more <laughs> impressive than the one that. At the, the one at the back honestly the one at the back that no no i don't like it yeah it, it looks um, uncomfortable <laughs> it's not it's not great but um the the women in this place are quite horrified when i just tells them about birth and uh women Same. with arms in in okay, the maybe not arms but the process of birth not not the best yeah in fact actually um some of them die after anodos tells them about birth <laughs> so that's you create some fairies yes <laughs> oh anodos so um it is it's although it's um it's kind of framed as not and not sort of them dying of shock or horror or anything like that. It's actually sort of implied in the text that it's um it's a kind of longing that they have for something Aww. that they can't um they can't it's achieve good. and that's why they kind of wander off and Okay, that's and, sadder. Uh, it is it is quite okay, sad. no, that's sadder. They also interestingly suggest, which makes sense when you think about their world, that because um the women in, in Anadis's world have arms, um that they must be very bold and masculine um, in their looks because... Do you hear that, ladies? <laughs> it's masculine to have arms. Yes. Um, mm. <laughs> but Anna does suggest that actually their wings are just sort of underdeveloped. Oh, um, maybe not. Maybe not. So maybe except differences <laughs> in people. So yes, I think that is probably the, the weirdest mother. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't top that, Hayley. I can't top that. <laughs> The one of the most interesting ones, in my opinion. I love it. Okay, so my other one, um, mother choice number two, or at least mothering figure number two, was Betsy Trotwood from David Copperfield, which I absolutely love. It is probably my favourite Dickens book. Um, debatable, I know. But, um, we're definitely one of... But the one that made me really love Dickens, David Copperfield. So I love it for that reason. I had the same experience. I really? Remember, yes. Okay. So um, I remember being at school and someone coming in with like this gorgeous, like new style um, edition, like a penguin edition. Mm. Um, it had like a bright yellow cover and I think like bright blue writing and someone had got it for Christmas and they didn't want it. So they were like, Emma, you like reading, don't you? And I was like, I do, I do. And I read it, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, oh that's very, very Peace appropriate. The so, yeah, I'm imagining that you probably like Betsy Trotford. I did, yes. Yeah. I did. So, um, you got to love her with her donkeys. Donkeys! <laughs> so, um, one of the, the things that I liked about David Copperfield was all the fairy references linking to George MacDonald. So there's lots of fairy tale obviously references in Dickens generally, but um, in 
David Copperfield, Betsy Trotwood in particular, is um, she's like the the fairy godmother figure. This is how Harry Stone describes her, and she is actually described by Dickens as like a fairy. He says, um, if if you remember, if you've read David Copperfield, um, when she realizes that David is a boy and not a girl, she just leaves uh, like a discontented fairy. Dickens is great. She just leaves, which obviously makes her seem like that fairy godmother because she's almost she's mm. almost literally taking that position without the magic. But um, the thing that I like her fairy tale reference, I also really like the strength of uh, Betsy Trotwood as a character and the very, very satisfying moment at the beginning when she confronts the Murdstones after poor David manages to escape because there is actually a mother. Uh, David's mother is in David Copperfield, but she dies quite near to the beginning. Slightly and ineffectual and then dies. So she hits two out of our three most common categories <laughs> for Victorian mothers. She does. Okay. I think because she is so frequently described as a child and a yeah. baby, and yeah. especially by um, Betsy Trotwood, she kind of she occupies both of those spaces. Mm. And so it's almost as though we never really blame her for not being able to yeah. fulfill the protective um, role for David because... Yeah, because she, she herself is manipulated. Yeah, she is kind of a child without a mother as well, um, which allows her to be... She really could have done with Betsy. Betsy. She really could. Yeah. Betsy should have stayed. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, but Betsy uh, needs to be the mother here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, obviously, as we were saying last time, if we're talking, thinking uh, legality in, uh, yes. in the Victorian period, it would not have worked if she had stayed and tried to um, try to overpower the husband yeah. in his his opinion. So, um, yeah, she she doesn't stay in there for very long, and she doesn't manage to protect David from the Murdstones, and she doesn't manage to protect herself from them either because they ultimately sort of lead to her death. They torment her and they torment David and they're just, they're just very horrible. And when David manages to run away and he gets to, um, to Betsy Trotwood and the Murdstones arrive there, that's a moment when everything kind of is turned on its head because up until now, as a child, David just couldn't do anything about the fact that he's being bullied, he's mm. having his character kind of misrepresented by the Murdstones, and that really hurts him, the fact that they're making other people think that he's yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, and even at times he, he feels like he is bad for the thing, the way he reacts to things. It's such a powerful characterization of that experience. Yeah, when he bites Mr. Murdstone. Just, I was right there with you, David. I was right yes. there with you. We approve. We do. Yeah, we do. But um, when in that moment, then, when they turn up and they're not at the um the rookery but at betsy trotwood's house um it is very different and in um the the setting of that scene david asks betsy should he should he leave should he go away well murdstone's there and she's like no no you stay here and she pens him in behind her chair which is sort of phrased as um, like trapping him in, but it's obviously also very protective. She's kind of putting a barrier between herself. Yeah, and she uh, is a wall. Yeah, between Which, David and yeah. the Murdstones. Um, and then she just thoroughly rips them apart by telling the truth. Delightful. <laughs> and we and love opens to up, yeah, all of these things that David has been able to see for all that time and not express properly and not confront because he's a child. Mm. She just lays them all open in front of the Murdstones with no, and no concern for kind of, is this socially acceptable? Um, in fact, Miss Murdstone keeps reminding her that it's sarcastically that she's being very rude um, most by saying like most polite I'm sure and, and things like that but um, yeah I find that to be a very satisfying moment and also of course the moment where she decides to keep David and becomes his mother figure um, immediately after that they they buy him some clothes um, he, he throws his arms around her and kisses her and it's, um, it's a very very nice moment in the book so she's my second choice for a uh, favourite mother I I took the last three, I took the last three mothers um, and I decided to go for 
an array of mothers. Um, so I started out with uh, The Tent of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte um, and the heroine Helen Graham. I'm, as, you, as I'm sure you all know, with Bronte novels, um, this is another thing we'll get onto with Gaskell, there's lots of different names for the same character. I'll mostly just be using one for sim simplicity and ease. Um, so Helen Graham is definitely one of my um, my favourite mothers of Victorian literature. Um, some may think she's boring and pious um, next to Catherine Earnshaw. Not me, not I. Um, I, I love Helen's story. Um, so kind of, excuse me, Bronte fans, Ignoring the structure of the story because it's sort of like the past and no, it's the present, then the past, then the future. It's mm. the structure is um, a teeny tiny bit confusing. So I'll just go through um, Helen's Helen's actual linear journey. Uh, so she marries uh, she marries for love or what she thinks is love. Um, you know she she loves this young man Arthur Huntingdon. Um, even though he's openly flirting with a lady called Arabella. Um, but she marries him against against good advice. Um, the flirtations do not stop. She is, of course, unable to reform him, um, even after they have a child. And it's when she has this child, um, and you know, for herself, she's still trying to cling on to the idea that she can reform him, she can make it work. But once she realises that... Um, her husband is teaching her child to swear and to drink alcohol and actually to torment animals and like mm. torture them as well. She's that sort of the bottom line. She's like, I don't think so. Um, we're not, we're not going down that path. So she makes quite a bold move. Um, she actually initially plans to get away. So, um, this also kind of links into what we were talking about last week with accomplishments. She's quite an accomplished young woman. Um, and so she makes a plan to move away with her son. She gets um, a collection of artist tools together um, and she gets prepared. But unfortunately, her husband finds them and he destroys them. And I just I loved um, the way that Anne Bronte sort of wrote the strength of character there. I was just thinking, even... Even if that's not possible, you know, she still she still made the decision to to move away, and she does eventually um, establish herself um, by eventually getting new tools. Um, and so she lives um, in the tent of Wildfell Hall, or she is the tent of Wildfell Hall. She lives in Wildfell Hall um, <laughs> with her son, um, selling pictures, despite the fact that everyone thinks she's a little bit suspicious because she is a young woman with a son but a husband um so there's lots of rumors and suspicions and um you know she gives uh gilbert this this man who she has met uh gilbert gilbert markham um she gives him her diaries to explain um what she's been through to dispel any of the rumors and to basically explain why she can't marry him um and again i I also really enjoyed that because I, I enjoyed her, her sense of self and her dedication to her child as well, um, sort of laying down those boundaries. That's why Helen Graham is one of my favourite mothers. Um, yeah, very understandable in literature. One. Yeah, I think so. Um, my next one, my next one is Mrs. Gibson from Elizabeth Gaskell's Wives and Daughters. Um, so the savvy amongst you might think, Victorian, truly. And yes, that's what I'm going with. Um, so Wives and Daughters was published between, um, it was originally published as a serial, so it was published between 1863 and 1865, but it is actually set 30 years um, previous. Um, and in some of the work that I'm doing at the moment, I actually argue that it's set in 1834, so three years before the Victorian period. But it's still written in 1863. Yeah, so counts. I think it counts. Um, so I chose Mrs. Gibson, not because she's an excellent mother, not because she's a paragon of virtue, um, but because I think she is a fantastic 
depiction. Um, she's one of those characters that you love to hate. So Mrs. Gibson is introduced in the opening chapters of Wives and Daughters. So there's this um, big day where all the like small daughters and um, all of the ladies of town essentially go to this um, aristocratic estate. It's called the Towers in the novel, and they sort of have a nice day um, being around the echelons of society. Molly, um, the heroine of our story, is originally really excited to go. She wakes up early, she puts on her dress, separated from her friends, the Miss Brownings. They're quite a bit older than her. They're a couple of quote-unquote spinster sisters. Um, and she gets hot and she gets bothered um, and she falls asleep um, on a little garden bench as well. And Mrs. Gibson finds her. But well, I should mention at that point, she's called Claire, which is actually her last name. But she's the governess um, for the girls at the Towers. The names are all very confusing. Um and she basically asks someone to to go away and um give her food and um you know the sleeping the sleeping Molly never gets that food. So this governess scoffs a lot, um kind of ignores Molly, um she doesn't ignore her outright, she does take her up to um her room, um her little governess quarters so she can have a nap. But obviously when it's time, everybody's already left. So Molly's also um, a little bit upset because her mother, dead. Again, one of our three, dead mum. So Molly's a little bit upset because because of that, she's really attached to her father. um, And everybody else is gone and everybody else has left her behind. And almost like David Copperfield, no one um, takes all that seriously because they're just like, oh, she's just a lazy child. She ate all this food and then like she fell asleep in the governess's quarters when actually she didn't. And she's still got a headache and she's feeling poorly. And she's in this this quite intense situation. It's quite um, like big rooms with like very fancy old people that she doesn't really understand. Um, and that's sort of our first introduction to the future Mrs Gibson. Molly being the sweet and very young child that she is doesn't actually explain what happened to her dad. So years later down the line when various other things happen essentially um, there's this young boy who is at um, his surgery so Mr Gibson is um, the local surgeon and he takes on lodges and he tries to slip Molly um, a love note and so Mr Gibson panics that he's losing his little girl um, and that he needs to do something and you know the governess that he has um, for her Miss Eyre is actually gone back home to tend to her own family they have a bout of illness and they need to go to the seaside so he realizes you know I could just get another governess but you know, what if she has another family emergency? I need somebody, I just, I need another member of my family. So I will, I will take a woman to wife. I will have a mother figure for Molly and then I won't have to worry anymore. And he sees the future Mrs. Gibson at the towers once again. She's on a little visit. She's since married. Again, very confusing at that particular moment in time. She's Mrs. Kirkpatrick. <laughs> but we're sticking with Mrs. Gibson. Um, and he proposes to her um, and she accepts and she becomes Molly's stepmother. And she is hilariously and frustratingly ineffectual. There are some really strong moments that are so annoying. She has a lot of ideas about what is proper. So, for example, she won't let her husband just eat like bread and cheese. He comes in after a really long day, has a quick supper. He usually has it with his daughter just in the kitchen. Lops off some bread, cuts off some cheese, has that. And she says, oh no, not refined. If it needs to happen, then it should be made into an (laughs) omelette. Man's not allowed his bread and cheese. It's... She's she's a true hindrance. Most people have bread and cheese. So she does. Uh, I she does other things. So she doesn't let Molly um, visit a friend who actually took her in. So after before Mr. Gibson proposes um, to the future Mrs. Gibson, he actually sends her away um, to the Hamley estate, which is also um, 
in the town of Hollingford um, and the woman there who has unfortunately lost her daughter many years before really takes to Molly and uh, Mrs Gibson won't let her out on on her deathbed she won't let Molly go and visit because she's like I'm the stepmom I should I should be in charge of where you go and it's purely for petty reasons that she keeps her from going um she's a great person to hate as well because some of it just seems completely um she has no sense of this is this is really weird lack of humanity Mm. she's so superficial and yet still such an intriguing character. So um, she wants to buy her daughter, because she has a daughter from Mr. Kirkpatrick, he's dead. Um, and she wants to buy her all new things. So she wants to buy like fancy French dresses, but she doesn't want to be accused of not being equally nice to Molly. So she gets both of their rooms done in the exact same style, which like, unless you have children who are very close and expressly ask for that, it's probably not a nice thing. And actually in doing so, uh, Mrs. Gibson gets rid of all of Molly's mother's old things. Oh no. It's really upsetting to witness. Like I say, she's one of those um, characters where you can't quite tell like what's malevolent and what's just a total lack of awareness Mm. and a lot of the time you just get so frustrated and you just oh you just love to hate her i love to hate her um and so we come on to we did a little bit of a a gradient here from angelic to (laughs) uh, um to not angelic so for our final mother I chose Mrs. Warren from Mrs. Warren's Profession, a play by George Bernard Shaw, published in 1893. I find this a fascinating text. Um, so the entire play is centred around the attempted reconciliation between Mrs. Warren and her daughter, Vivi. Now, her daughter, Vivi, is a thoroughly modern young woman. She actually attended university. Um, she got a degree in mathematics. Uh, it, it says in the play that it would be equal to third wrangler, but at that particular moment in time, the degree can't be conferred upon her. So she has attended university. She does have a degree education, but I don't think she's actually able to have the actual degree. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Thoroughly modern young woman, very modern um, ideas of um, independence, of um, flirtations as well, you know, um, she has a couple of couple of men throughout the play show an interest in Vivi. Um and she's quite quite open to having a flirt and potentially is thinking about um marriage, but you know, maybe not. Um, you know, she has some she has some thoughts about what she might do instead. But um so Mrs. Warren has has paid for this education, she's paid for everything that um Vivi has. She sort of made Vivi in many senses. Um, and throughout the course of the play, we get onto what was Mrs. Warren's profession. And Mrs. Warren, um, she has a series of misfortunes in her life when she's a younger woman. And it turns out that she is not in fact married. She has taken on the married name. And it turns out that in her younger days, she was engaging in sex work. And that's how she accumulated her money. Um, and this comes out during the course of the play. Um, and originally, Vivi is she's shocked, she's taken aback. She she really doesn't know how to how to behave or how to interact with her mother. Um, and and her mother essentially kind of she sets it down with basically saying, you know, this this isn't um, this isn't a moral degradation for her. It was a financial necessity. Um, and, and Vivi does eventually sort of come to understand that. And there is this moment of reconciliation between the two of them, which is immediately shattered, Haley. Okay. Um, because, of course. Of course. Uh, because it transpires that although Mrs. Warren herself um, relinquished sex work some time ago, so she's procuring young women um, and essentially setting them up in hotels throughout Europe and essentially taking their money from them and that's how she's kept herself in this quite affluent style another side plot is that um 
the person who she seems to be quite close with it actually ends up being her business partner and there's some indication that the young man um who is a relative of this man might actually be the the result of yeah. of their relationship and actually Vivi's half brother so oh. there's a moment where they're thinking of potentially marriage and this kind of comes out and they're just like we don't know. So do you know what? Uh, handshake, goodbye forever. Uh, <laughs> and isn't it really interesting that it actually matches up with um, a text that we talked about last month? Mm. Um, Jennifer and I was telling you about that particular um, novel where it turns out the sailor turns up at the end and he's like, my children. And it turns out these two people who might have been love interests at one point are actually half siblings. Mm. Um, so it's interesting that that seems to be a recurring okay. theme. Yeah. Of all the themes, <laughs> you might not have thought that one, but a very memorable um, twist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Vivi, in the end, she cuts all ties with her mother and basically says she's, she's going to go it alone, possibly as a typist. Um, and so Mrs. Warren is sort of left alone with this really difficult feeling of it is due to the things that she had to do and continue to do to put you know Vivi through university because you know, she's still throwing a lot of money at her child um and that Vivi can have can reject her she made her daughter and her daughter has has rejected her. Her daughter has, has profited from all of this. Um, but in doing so, in giving so many um such a such a big leg up in life, um, Vivi is, is so different from her mother, and that kind of becomes this irreconcilable gap between the two of them. But I just think she's a really fascinating character um for an 1893 play. I mean the play isn't actually performed to, until 1902, so just out the Victorian period, but it was written in 1903. 1990, 1890, 1893. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's still example. And a more complicated mother daughter relationship. relationship. Yeah, something that's a little more contentious. Although, although possibly, po I only say possibly, easier to solve than opposable wings. Yes. I, I agree. <laughs> How does it work, George? How does it work? Mm. Things to overcome. <laughs> yeah, on our list. Thank you for listening to part one of our Mother's Day episode. Join us again tomorrow for part two. Top tips and curious bits for mothers in Victorian periodicals.